Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report and uh, one of our main anchors on our live stream channel and here every Thursday. And, of course, popping in with emergency reports all the time, Tim Alexander, Lord Sterling, has a remarkable website called uh, europebusiness.blogspot. If you want to Google it, just put in Lord Sterling, S-T-I-R-L-I-N-G, and you'll find it. Uh, your reports are finding their way into all kinds of interesting places where people are kind of finding out things. Uh, you have any, any kind of an urgent report. CIA, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, uh, yeah I may be the Earl Sterling in Scotland, but uh, I'm an old boy from Evanston, Indiana. Well, you're, and you're uh, right up the road a bit is Monroe County. It's the home of Indiana University. Spent a couple of years there. Ran for state representative when I, in 1972. Youngest person in the state to ever run for state representative. So Brown, Lawrence, Monroe counties for the district. I know it quite well. Now, what we got in Indiana is an outbreak of swine flu in human beings in four widely separated counties. Uh, only confirmed at one yet. They're in the process of confirming yeah, okay. it. All, you know, all the, the CDC stuff takes a very long time. Well, it'll take but, back uh, in four days, but what, here's what happens. And I just listened last night to Henry Nyman's discussion on REDS. So I'm going to be researching this for our forward and right, commonomics and the other viral sites. The one that's surging right now is called H3N2V. Right. And what it does, it contains a lethal genes from H1N1, which is the swine flu that came out in 2009. Now, for the morons out there that thought Dr. Deagle's wrong, I'm giving you an intellectual slap. Because you really realize you don't know what you're talking about when you said it wasn't a big deal. Ten times more young people died of that swine flu epidemic than ever died since 1918. Ten times. A lot of people got very damn sick with it. But that was only a prelude. That was kind of like a forewarning of what's coming. This latest one may not even be the worst way, but it's going to be bad. Uh, according to Henry Nyman, it's not just in, in Indiana. They're picking it up across other states in the United States, so we're having a massive surge. Yeah, we know how. I've just heard the report Florida, but uh, well, this, is, this is what's so interesting about this. Well, there are many things interesting about this. What's right. the vector? I've, I've been on the phone with the governor's office in Indiana, with the, uh, the Indiana Department of Health, and with the Monroe County Department of Health. And and, you know, these are good people, but I have to tell you that, uh, and this is true not just of Indiana, but of most states and most counties across the country, they, their standard protocol is mere, is not set up for a pandemic. They're lost in space. They, uh, the, the, for instance, the, the lady in Monroe County, I, I said, okay, what are you specifically doing uh, because of this outbreak in Monroe County? And, uh, well, I, I, you know, and she kind of uh, rattled on, and I said, okay, but specifically, are you doing anything specific? You're not doing anything specific. She said, well, I wouldn't say that. I said, okay, okay. what specifically are you doing? Okay, and, Tim, and, and Tim, the answer is nothing. Here. I yeah. said, are you calling every physician, every primary care physician and every specialist, right. uh, you know, in, in respiratory, et cetera, every day, and the hospital every day? No. Uh, when I asked that of the, the State Department of Health, are you doing that? No. The governor's office, no. And I, I told the governor's office, I said, look, uh, if you've ever seen, and, and I am a theoretical weapons strategist and designer, I know a heck of a lot about advanced right. bio war, and, and, and of course I know you do too, Dr. Bill, but yeah. if you've ever seen a bio war outbreak, time is absolutely at the critical. Whether, right. it, whether it's, we, it's we man-made know. or right. not man-made, well, time I got is absolutely critical. You have to get out in front to know where the progression is, and you cannot rely on normal reporting. First off, normal okay. reporting misses most of it. You're counting on a doctor who, if he sees flu, he's supposed to report. Well, this may... That, first off, a lot of people don't even go to the doctor. Secondly, right. those that do, the doctor is too busy. He doesn't get paid for reporting well, it. They, they don't Secondly, even do viral cultures. They, they look, they, let, me, let me give a couple things. First off, your official that you talk to needs to have a surgical procedure. It's called a cranial rectal extraction. <laughs> But they're all like that. I'm sorry. This, this is the norm. <laughs> and anybody can figure that out. means removing the head from the rectum. Number two. <laughs> here's the second thing that has to happen. Number one, I was at a, a, what's called a CDC reference site, uh, which and also state health department, because they, I was measuring viral cultures when I had my practice in Denver. And I asked other doctors, including internists and primary docs, and virtually none of them were doing viral cultures. They had no idea what virus it was. There was no rapid reporting. No rapid, no, none of them. I even had this special rapid... Uh, uh, Z-stat tests were actually measuring if they had quote, the flu, you know, influenza A, A. So at least we know they had flu rather than something else in my office, so I could tell in five minutes. 
here's the problem. We know that this is a, what I call a pre-launched pandemic, and I'll explain what that means. We need to go back to pre-2009. When this epidemic from, in, in the swine flu came out, it came out Mexico. within, I think, Mexico. It came out of uh, a few miles away in a little village where workers actually were inside the Baxter Pharmaceutical Plant in South of Mexico exactly. City. And this was an emergent flu. And we had a virologist from Australia that came on, who was their top virologist from Canberra, who actually made a statement that this was a genetically engineered uh, tricontinental, uh, basically a recombinant virus. In other words, this didn't happen spontaneously because bird A touched bird B or pig or whatever. This was a virus that emerged from a lab, got into the local community. Now, of course, it's mutated enough and swapped genes enough through recombination. People may assume that it's a naturally occurring thing. Oh, my gosh. But it's this not. Happen? And I want to give you credit. You said this was going to happen, Dr. Deagle. You right. said it, and you said it time and time again. Now, here's what's going to happen to this one. This is not the final wave, by the way. No. This wave... And I've said this before, and I want people to remember that I've said in advance, just like I told them about the straight of four moves. We are going to enter the new world order, not with a gun to our head, but with a mask against the virus on our face. Now, when you have a scared population and people dying in the streets afraid to travel or go out in public, that's when you can get their guns. That's when there's no food moving. That's when trucks are afraid to even deliver gasoline. That's when you've got literally contagion. And people say, Dr. Deagle, it can't get that bad. Oh, yes, it oh, can. Oh, yes, it can. Now, let me explain. My, great, my grandmother... Pestilence, my, war, famine, and, and death. Right. And my grandmother way, lost a brother and a Europe sister. And yeah. Russia, the crops are failing. Crops are failing all over the United States. I'm in the farm belt. I'm in the area worst hit. i got to tell you, it is pathetic. Right. We have... You, you, some of the car... And you, you look at it and you think, well, okay, it's got ears on it. A lot of it is three foot tall or four foot tall and tasseled, and they're, right. and they're cutting it down. But some of you think, well, okay, well, there are at least ears of corn on. There may be ears of corn, but if they planted it too late and we got in this 100 degree weather, by the way, it's 100 degrees again here in southern Indiana today. But there's no corn kernels on well, the cob. Well, that's why I'm telling people to go, pollinate. That's why I'm telling people right now to go to PrepareWise. Here's what I see coming, okay? And they're based on this virus breaking out. In the next two months, if it continues, it's doubling time. Now, what's, what do you think the doubling time, if you get a true pandemic virus that spreads quickly, that has a incubation period of anywhere from 48 hours to 10 days? What do you think the doubling time for this is? 24 hours. Four days. Okay, well. Four days, four days. Okay, so let's say, and we don't even know when this really started, but let's say it's X, okay? And X might be, let's say already we have, say, 10,000 people infected. And we don't know how it's, how it's getting from point A to point right. B. Now, if you just took that, just like, I'd ask a question to people that don't know math, and I said, now, what would you like? Would you like me to give you a million dollars, or at the end of a month give you a penny if I doubled it every second? <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> and they'd say, geez, I'd like to have the million dollars. I said, you don't know oh, this, do you? Okay. <laughs> I said, how about the penny? Okay. <laughs> now, think of that in terms of a virus. Now, the virus, if it multiplies or, you know, doubles in terms of the number of people that spread to every four days, minimum every four days, okay? But it, every four days, you have a, a massive increase. And the reason, that, that's, by the way, the, the evident, the actual number of people infected, for every person that has the virus, they're going to infect before it becomes evident they're sick, at least 12 people, right? So this thing spreads. We did a at least, war, depending we, on how the virus is designed. Right. We did actually a war game simulation. We borrowed NOAA computer time from the National Air, uh, Oceanographic Administration supercomputer in Boulder, Colorado, and we paid for it with federal money. And I worked with the uh, Infectious Disease Unit at the University of Colorado, uh, Reserve Admiral John Hughes, the hazmat teams from the state of Colorado, and federal FBI and CDC officials. I was one of their point men working directly with them. And when they did a war game simulation, they actually bought it and ran a supercomputer analysis. And in 90 days, it went from one person arriving with a pandemic infection in Oklahoma City to infecting 93 million Americans in 90 countries of the world. Absolutely. That's now, people say, that can't happen. I was thinking, well, get a reality works. check. And, you and can. There are some scenarios that are even worse. Right. That was a war game. So, Tim, here, uh, you, you're very good at putting this all together. And let, let's just get all the forest and the trees view. Here we have an emerging pandemic. We have the melting down. Now, Italy and, and, uh, and 
and uh, Spain are meeting because they can't meet their debts. European Central Bank and Germans are say they 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 are not even allowed by law. And our crops are failing, and so is the Russian so, crops and our crops. Go ahead. Right. Okay. And on top of that, on top of that, we have uh, some news, and we're going to talk about this tomorrow. I personally haven't got any corroboration that this quote object we call the they call the uh, Passover Star Nibiru, whatever you want to call it, is moving into our airspace in the near future. Although we know it is coming. We also know that there's an object that's very large, and I mentioned this before, you can go to Jet Propulsion Labs, uh, and you can pull up 2012 DA-14, a very large object, which is going to pass on my birthday, 2013, February 15th. 5,000 miles from the Earth, 1% error, and it keeps on getting in closer the more they recalculate it. Plus, there's debris with that, anywhere from the size of a bus to the size of an aircraft carrier. So what we have to realize is that we're moving into... Extreme climate shift, which is basically famine, like the ancient famine of Joseph. <clears throat> We're moving into a time when pandemics are occurring. And as I said before, the ideal way, and this was given to me by documents by doctors who smuggled them out of the World Health Organization headquarters in, in Switzerland, gave them to me March 17, 1997, in a private meeting with the headquarters of Human Life International in Zurich. They gave them to me face-to-face. Okay, so this is not like... Oh, Deagle, just as your opinion. No, it isn't. These are the actual documents that got smuggled out of the World Health Organization headquarters. They want to slay the world with a plague. Okay? More than a war, even. A war is one day, ah, they can take out, they can squeeze eventually. They'll, look, the West will eventually squeeze Syria and Iran. They're, gonna be, they're eventually going to do it, okay? We, we know that. Syria will fall. Iran will eventually fall. And the Russians will eventually let them let it go. And the reason why they're going to do it because they want a good par- partners in the New World Order. But that's well, not going to be the end if, of it. If when Syria and Iran go, they'll hit back. They're, no, they're, they're, they're prepared. But, but well, they may be prepared, and we're going to be a level of destruction. But the thing is, what we can do to them is much worse than they can do to us. But here's what I think is going to happen: they're going to be only partially castrate. And what will happen is the Russians and Chinese, which are now totally ticked off with the West. I mean, the latest is that now we're making sanctions against the Chinese bank as we're saying it's the China Bank of Iraq that it actually is used uh, to try to exchange funds so the Iranians can sell their oil. Now, the Iranians can't even buy staples for their 80 million population. This is an act of war. This is the same kind of crap that happened that caused the First World, Second World War, where the Japanese were actually collaborating on the Germans on building the nuclear bomb, and the Japanese, and I have the proof, okay, and I've talked about this before, that the the blockade that we did against Japan is what brought them into the war. This blockade is determined. Well, it was designed to do that. It was designed right. by a submarine commander, a, a naval captain, who uh, came up with this strategy and, and presented it to the right people, and it got all the way went all the way up to FDR, and uh, he followed the strategy, and, and it was a several right. step and, policy and, to get and, the, and by the, the way, Japs FDR, to attack us. By the way, the FDR knew. I heard three to five weeks before the attack on Pearl Harbor, oh, yeah, moved the fifth fleet out to from a, a Russian spy right. uh, who was well placed in Japan. Uh, they knew where the the, the 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 Japanese fleet did not maintain absolute radio silence. We had to move our fleet out of the North Central Pacific so we wouldn't run into them. We knew roughly where the fleet was. That's why we didn't have our carriers there. We didn't care about these little battleships. Uh, you know but that was. Uh, but of course, uh, you know, nine one one was far beyond that. At least. Right. They attacked us. We baited them. At least they attacked us. Yeah, but, but one more. One, one, well, no, 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 that, that was, was actors. Different. That was actors attacking us. And, and, and by the way, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm I'm fast closing on a lab that'll actually do the testing of the material. I'm not going to say where it is because I don't want to block. But I'm fast closing on a lab to prove that they used uh, a chain of pearls of micronukes to the central core of both World Trade Center and Tower One and Two in Building Six. And that they use super thermate, and that it was a controlled demolition. There, there can be and, no other explanation. For and there were basically if you actors. Know the science, there can be no other explanation. And by the way, these, these are pseudo Muslim actors that were acting out a war game, and I'm probably they were just as surprised as everybody else as to what happened when they were, probably were nerve gassed in the building. Those planes were remotely flown away because the buildings were hit with remotely targeted E10s, which look the same size as commercial American Airliners jets, because they had pods underneath it that people photograph, which are the type of pods used. They were installed in uh, Fort Collins, Colorado. I have the contacts and know exactly how they did it. Uh, So these could be floated by a thing called Global Hawk. 
That system basically has been around since the 1970s. It was one that they had designed to actually be able to remotely fly in their original well, even idea. if they didn't do that, the Boeing 757 and 767 have a remote. They, it's a fly-by-wire system. Uh, there's no hydraulic linkage. It's, it's a, a, a multi-redundant computer system with uh, three, at least three sets of wires that go to each computer, and the computer activates a, a electrical uh, device that moves the wings lose their runs and right. etc because the planes are too big anymore for hydraulic linkage so right. basically what you have uh, and, and they can access that remotely with a code and, and take control of the airplane. It's exactly. a hijacking feature. It's well known. It's been out there a year. It's, it's been there and basically and published several years before nine one one. By the way, every by the way, every aircraft has that. I used to talk about the uh, uh, the the perfect storm from hell, the the carnicopia from hell. Well, we're we're approaching this. There are the four horsemen of the apocalypse. To use any uh, metaphor you want. It's pestilence, war, famine, and death. Right. Now, I tell people, they need to get prepared. That's why we have prepare-wise. They need to get their food, water, and their nutraceuticals in. They need to have their personal defense. Why do they think, and I mentioned this before, and I had some negative feedback, and I'm going to ask people a series of questions so I'll dispel their ignorance. Number one, if you are a uh, police officer, if you're a medical doctor, or if you're the county sheriff, would you give a gun certificate for the character, Mr. Holmes, to actually purchase guns, knowing that, quote, he supposedly was seeing a psychiatrist, was on antipsychotic medications, and was having uh, psychotic fugues where he thought he was going to mass kill. No. Okay, well, what are you going to do to replace that? Well, I personally think, and I think this is the solution, is that we have voted for the county sheriff. Now, people may say they disagree with this, but you have to have some way of a chain of command. If you're in the military, you have to have a chain of command. The boss, the general, is the county sheriff. The county sheriff is the one you go to if you want a concealed carry permit anywhere in the United States. The county sheriff should have a list of all the guns that are in his county and should not, N-O-T, in 12-foot high letters, share them with the state or the federal government or any other agency, uh, CSIS or Interpol or any other uh, agency. Well, I don't like the idea of the county sheriff having a list, but the, well, they have there to, are they have to have a list out there. No, no, I'll, tell you what, I'll tell you why it should be a county sheriff, and it should be a lockdown list, and it should be highly secured. And the reason why they need it is, number one, is you want to have volunteers for a militia. Because we're going to move in a time where we're going to need a civilian militia. Now, when I worked with the Federal Center in Denver, and I worked with Special Forces in Delta, because I worked with them firsthand, they told me, and from multiple sources, in fact, I spent an entire week in St. Louis regarding this issue when we did uh, a special American Academy of Environmental Medicine conjointly with Special Forces in Delta, they told me straight up, within 4 to 12 days after any breakdown, power outage, plague like swine avian flu, uh, you know, a, a coronal mass ejection that knocked out the power grid, anything, that civilian militia or gangs would control every city, town, and every nation on earth. Now, if you don't have the way to have a civilian militia is to have number one a list of guns, make sure those people have taken their course and knows to operate them. Actually, come out to meet with the sheriff and actually maybe do stuff on a weekend, once a week, in, uh, a in month. Slightly over half the states. They have, uh, and it, it varies from state to state what they call it. In Indiana, we call it the Indiana Guard Reserve. Right, right. In California, I think it's the State Military Reserve. Texas is this Texas State right. Guard. Right, uh, this should be operated, but what we need to do is we need to come with a county sheriff, and they should have the list so they can call up people if they need to, if there's a power outage or something. Well, they can make those people. Look at this power outage in India. 700 million people almost with a power Now, uh, this weekend, I'm going to be doing a major update to my uh, four, 10 plus list that we do with John Moore in preparation for tomorrow. John has some major updates uh, we'll talk about tomorrow regarding the approach of this object. There's a number of shows gone on. I've, I've had lots of requests. I've been very remiss not to do other shows because I'm not jumping and chomping at this idea that the, uh, I call the Passover star is coming in, but there's lots of other things that we can quantitatively say without even speculating. Famine is here right now. If you don't go prepare-wise and get extra food, if you don't get you know five-gallon containers to store water, if you don't get your personal protection, since this incident's happened in Aurora, the number of gun sales and ammo sales went through the ceiling. Uh, I personally ordered some specialty ammo. I remember your request. You told me that I should order some specialty ammo uh, for my shotgun. I got it. I got lots. And some fact, real is, interesting stuff there. Yeah. Right now, let me tell you. Here's my approach. I think anybody who's sane is not crazy should be able to order any weapon they want. 
to providing to take the course, and the county sheriff should have a registry, and and the county sheriff can call you up and say, hey, do you want to come down uh, this weekend because we're going to do a special thing on a Saturday afternoon, and we're going to do a little shooting, and we're going to kind of talk about tactics if we had a power outage or a major disaster. I'll give you a scenario. Let's say, and this is not prophetic, it's just a theoretical. Let's say it's September 14th, and now... This pandemic, H1N1 flu, is really, H3N2 flu, V, substrain V, has really taken off. And now we've got 100,000 dead across America in two months, okay? Now, my, my grandmother told me the story years ago about how back when the 1918 flu happened, how her, um, Spanish her little, flu. Her, yeah, the Spanish flu, how her sister died of it. And her brother was so upset he had to lean into the coffin and grab her and hug her before they, they closed the coffin and put her into the grave. And the next week they buried him. Yeah. Now it comes close to home. You don't even realize how many people got this. And by the way, if you had the H1N1 flu, you have no protection. There is no vaccine against this. And this thing keeps on mutating and changing. So if you think, oh, I'm going to get the vaccine. In fact, the government may be crazy enough to say, we're going to make the vaccine mandatory. They can't make enough vaccine. If they could make a vaccine that would help, it would only go to continuity of government, politicians, and I won't take any of their vaccines because I don't trust the best. By the way, if you want to protect yourself, start simply with our antipathogenics, Nutridyne, Alamax, Silver 100, Immunomax. Start taking our first-line defense kit and be prepared for the fact that the population is getting weakened by Fukushima. And that kind of segues into what's going on now. What's happening with Fukushima? Chris, what's the latest? Okay, yeah, well, at Fukushima, you know, they're, we're coming out with some, uh, I remember almost like a year ago, we, we uh, conjectured, that was my team and I, uh, we, we, and we, we keep in touch still. We said, you know, Unit 2 obviously has a damage containment, and we just found some FOIA reports that were just released. You know, it takes, it takes really a long time to go through the thousands of pages that they release at one time, one time. But there were some uh, email in there from uh, the NRC also knew it. They just weren't talking about it. So we weren't wrong, and we're just using the same indications that they were. We came up with the same, uh, came up with similar conclusions. And it's just interesting to note that um, we're only learning about the fact that they knew but didn't tell us really what was going on way, way back then, you know. Fortunately, the, the team and I were, were on top of it. We, we pretty much came up with the same conclusions, but it wasn't being reported. Now, I guess that kind of sticks in my craw. That, uh, yeah, it does, and of course reason. they purposely hit it, too. In fact, the two informal reports here, and I'm going to read the highlight of it because we'll send the, put the link up, is informable. It talks about the March 26, 2011, Unit 2 thought to have leaked uh, leak break provided a connection between the Taurus and the primary containment, which they hid. And in an April 4th, 2011 report, water with dose rate of more than 1,000 millisieverts per hour leaking directly into the sea. 81%, this is according to the Stanford University report, 81% of the radiation went directly into the ocean. This is crazy. They're also not talking about the air contamination and air plumes. I've tried repeatedly, and I'm going to put more information together to Senator Feinstein's office in Washington, D.C., and her assistant, uh, to get them to start doing air sampling. We don't have any data. None. Nada. We get no response whatsoever from the government officials. And I, he said, well, don't you think the EPA are doing their job? I said, with rad data? I said, are you kidding? They don't even keep their RadNet facilities operational. They don't provide the data in a timely fashion. Yeah, but they don't you give can us count on the fact somebody is, and, and they know it's bad, and that's why <clears> they're <throat> making a big effort not to give you data. Well, here's what's going to happen, and I've said this before. The effect of a, of a pandemic uh, flu, the groundwork is to decrease the mitochondrial function, which will decrease the natural killer cell activity, which will weaken the herd immunity of the population so a plague will spread. And as this bioaccumulates, there's two crossing lines where the weakness of the population due to bioaccumulation of radiotoxins crosses and the recombination of the flu gets more pathogenic and gets spread. <clears throat> what happens is the person is well long enough so they can spread to dozens of people before they themselves get sick and or die. And as a result you're going to have a pandemic so when those two lines cross which we could be weeks away or months away you're going to have a major catastrophic pandemic in america and worldwide and that's an absolute it's not like oh deagle that's just your speculation no, it's like if you take black powder and red phosphorus and other things and you mix them together you better be uh, wearing a special you know gloves because you're going to blow your hands off okay this is going to happen this is not like oh well that's just speculation uh, we're going to have a problem. Tell us about the Japan's Chubu Electric uh, Company faces a moment of truth for the damaged reactor. What's going on there? 
Well, it turns out there was some damage that's uh, true. But you know, what? I'll be honest with you. Um, I don't know very much about that about that particular unit, except I knew they were having some trouble and getting yeah, that, that report was so, August August second too. So I'm just pulling yeah, up the report. Yeah, very recent. Yep, yep. And, it was just uh, an August second report. Yeah. Uh, I just popped open the report here directly online. Of course, that's the advantage of computers now. It says water leak uh, suggested faster than usual corrosion and damage to core of Japanese biggest nuclear reactor shut uh, since May of 2011. That's Chubu Electric, right? Uh, Chubu Electric Power Company could face the prospect of decommissioning Japan's biggest nuclear reactor after reassuring, assessing damage last month from the world's first known seawater infiltration of a reactor core. So. What we're talking about is not Fukushima. There's reactors all over Japan that get damaged by the earthquake. And that's what that, that's what is the big concern, of course. And I say I don't know a lot about that particular unit. This is really because I don't know exactly how it was in relation to the, the earthquake and, and, uh, and any other problems that it had. I do know where it is, and I just uh, hadn't overlaid any. But like I said, it was a brand new, well, you know, it is a brand new report. They are talking about actually decommissioning that one or revamping well, it if the, it's possible. This one's at Hamioka, number five unit with uh, when Chibu Electric was shutting down Hamioka in May last year on orders that then Prime Minister Naoto Khan, because of concerns of a large earthquake, might have struck nearby producing a tsunami, but overwhelmed. So they decided, well, let's just shut it down and figure out what's going on. They realized, oh my gosh, they had 400,000 liters, 88,000 gallons of corrosive causing seawater entered the turbine building with 5,000 liters getting into the reactor itself. That's, Duh. That is, that's a big deal. <clears throat> It's a very big deal. Yeah. Now, yeah. here's what's happening. Uh, let's look at our, at our quandary right now. We have the fool in the White House who's doing nothing about Japan. We have another fool trying to get elected, uh, Romney, who basically, uh, if he gets elected, he'll be the first Asperger's president, right? Asperger's autism. We have a situation where our government officials, including the EPA, are covering up data or not doing anything. We have state senators like Senator Wyden now two months in will not respond to me, even call or email. Senator Feinstein, I talked to her so-called environmental nuclear expert, and they, like, don't get it. And i got to kind of take them by the hand like a kindergartner and say, this is the way to the bathroom. It's disturbing. Then I call our academy, and, I, and I'm trying to prepare an analysis, which I'll have ready by this weekend, for a 500 to 1,000-word article to our academy doctors. Even the Academy of Environmental Medicine quote, doesn't have a, quote, resident expert that's actually put all the stuff together. Guess who it is? It's me. Now, you have to understand out there how bad this is. It's like if you're in an army and you're like the 300, you know, they talk about the, the, doing the ancient battle of, of the Greeks and the, and the uh, invading armies coming from, from, <laughs> from the ancient empire, right? And you're the 300. And it turns out there's not 300, there's like two other guys beside you. This is not good. You know, we got... Chris Harris, and luckily your guys behind you, and a few other people like uh, Chris Busby, there's not many actually even asking the right questions. That's what's particularly disturbing about this. Now, we do special shipments for Japan of Neutrodyne and other nutraceuticals to protect them. We know that this is causing birth defects, it's causing genetic malformations. And on Monday when we get Christina Consolo, we even have videos and others that show mutations are showing up all over the northern hemisphere in life forms that are particularly absorb radiotoxins. This is going to get real bad. And uh, so, the, by the way, this place, Hemioka, is 120 miles southwest of Tokyo, which means the earthquake was big enough that it actually destroyed the f reactor 5 at Hamaoka, which is really big news. It means the reactors, and we know this, all over Japan were damaged. They want to open the OI reactor, which, to great consternation of the public, because it's sitting literally on fault lines crisscrossing that are guaranteed to blow it. They're doing a war game still now, which you know in logistics, and I'd like you to explain this, Tim. The logistics is you bring in a war game from America, you embed warehouses, troops, you have people that stay there. Most of the contingent leave, but they can fly back in a C-130 or other aircraft. So they're ready to rock and roll two months or two years from now if Tokyo needs to be evacuated. Well, I personally think... Tokyo needs to be evacuated today. Anybody over there listening that hasn't evacuated, you're crazy because it's only a matter of time before we have another major quake, uh, before we have another major release of radiation just from the degradation of the site. 
And when that happens, you're not going to have time or even a way to get away. <clears throat> yeah, there's, just, there's, uh, it may be, there may be some safe areas in Japan, uh, kind of a, in the south. Yeah, you may, uh, you might be able to fly 500 or 500 or 1,000 kilometers, but, and that's, but, you know, upwind. Uh, most of Japan, the people should, should have already. Most of Japan, they should go. They should go to the southwest. But here's the other thing. They're now done test burns and now burning this trash all over Japan. So now it doesn't matter where you are. They're going to remobilize this trash, so there's no place that's now free of radiation. Uh, I, I, you know, that's beyond uh, insane. Right. I, I, I guess it's satanic. I, I mean, I, I, it, when you get to a certain point, it's so insane. What do you call it? Satanic? Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, now, uh, I, I'm going to venture a guess that because the prevailing winds are carrying the most radiation in our direction, if you were to measure radiation levels in the south part of Japan, let's say uh, some of the southern islands, etc., that are that are west and south of of the northern islands of Honshu, their radiation levels are lower than California or Oregon or Indiana. That's my guess. That the prevailing winds are going to carry most of the radiation in the opposite direction, and that in fact what they're doing. Is it in the northern Japan islands? Though they're really going to get blasted. If this radiation takes off, the zone of radiation will be massive. Plus, that's only a guess. These winds and current, ocean currents, carry radiation in the opposite direction. They carry it westward toward the South China Sea, and we know the 22 provinces in China were reporting radioactivity within four days after the March 11, 2011 disaster. Yeah. yeah. So, that, yeah, and don't forget, we've, that is confirmed that there's a huge <coughs> aqueous release in that, as, as we had suspected. Tell so, us about the aqueous release. Correct. Tell us about the aqueous release. Well, uh, well that, that, was, that was part of the FOIA that was talking about the, um, uh, what was the figure, a thousand millisieverts? Per, yeah, a thousand uh, millisieverts. That's from the informable article, yeah. Yeah, that's correct. Well, that, that it's a <coughs> informable, and it's from a FOIA, an actual FOIA document that, uh, yeah. that stated that. So, yeah, in fact, um, it says possible road of outflow to the ocean. I'll actually put, cut and paste these actual articles over as well right after yeah. the show. Uh, I mean, why, these things coming out right now, the people of Japan must be freaking right out. And I don't understand why we don't have a, a something going to the International Court of Justice to stop the Japanese from remobilizing the toxins, helping them to get rid of the debris, uh, bringing over military forces and our nuclear forces to actually contain this disaster before it goes completely... Uh, <laughs> Haywire. Well, Dr. Bill, what you have is, is is a propaganda matrix. Unless you listen to shows like uh, ours, unless you go to the alternative media, you get the gobbledygook, uh, the snooze news, that uh, the, the, well, there are six companies that own 96% of, of the American news media. Well, I'm going to ask you a question, if you know his name. Who is the guy that shows up all the time from CNN with his white hair and his you know very perky smile, uh, almost every disaster. What's his name? Uh, don't know. Okay, I, I just want to say, do you know Chris who I'm talking about? I don't want to give him any any positive press here, but anyway, this individual shows up everywhere. Does he ever ask tough questions like this? Nada. <laughs> if he did, if he did, and I'm not going to say who he is, he would get fired or any other person. In fact, the guy at Fox News has started asking questions about the the shooter in Aurora. Just asked a couple of what I call logical questions, because you can tell he was a little enraged by this, you know, about what happened, like, what's the background? The latest I've heard is that the Aurora shooter was under psychiatric care, and he, quote, apparently was aware that there was some kind of report sent to local officials that he was a danger. I think, ah, this guy's buying what's, all what's these guns. What's the drug? Sopo, sopocaine that uh, if they give you, you're pliable and you don't remember anything for uh, for for literally days? Uh, I always, I, I, I couldn't be a physician. I, I'd be prescribing uh, uh, the wrong thing right and <laughs> hey, left. But anyway, you know any, I got a question for you. This is a little humor. Do you know why doctors write so badly? Because the pharmacists figure out what the doctor should have given it and give it even to the bad right with a bad writing. I got two brothers that are pharmacists, and they laugh at that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like the fact that we're, we're such a higher degree happy co co country now that pharmacists are now doctors. They have a, a D farm, a doctor of uh, pharmacy degree. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, everybody's a doctor. Oh, but, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> it's disturbing. Anyway, um, 
What would you say, Chris, is happening in, in America? Now, since we had this new director, we've got rid of Jasco. What's the latest word out of what's going on with safety of San Onofre? Are they going to restart the plant? What's happening elsewhere? What are the plants being shut down? Are they ready for extreme weather? What is going on, right? Okay, let, let me go start with the electrical systems of the, of the plants. We've, we've had a rash uh, since the beginning of the year, and I did bring it up that uh, loss of off-site power has struck at least eight different power plants in the United States. Uh, Due to various causes, and some of them are pretty suspect. You know, I started off thinking about the, you know, CMEs and ground currents, and perhaps even some intervention by uh, uh, SCADA hacking and things like that. You know, all, all of which has not been disproved, and uh, it's very difficult if they're going to tell me what it is or not. Uh, but there was just last week a report about vulnerabilities at all nuclear power plants due to, and I sent that to you by the way. Uh, it's important, and it says there are some vulnerabilities that do affect the off-site power that have been recently discovered. Now is due to the Byron plant that was shut down, and then its uh, its twin Byron, the, the other unit, also was affected. Also, and uh, there were some pretty major problems due to that because the uh, the vulnerability involved looking at only a single phase of uh, remember this is three phase power, or, or so I don't want to get too technical, but there's three phase power, and uh, the instruments looking for a loss of power was only looking at one of the three phases, so it thought, and it was looking at the wrong one. There really should be instruments on all three phases for, for a real sure uh, shutdown so you get a real positive signal, but oh, they're not, they're not built that way, and it was, it was deemed that it, you could not lose a single phase um, and, and keep the other two running. It, the plant can't run that way. It wrecks all kinds of damage and havoc. Uh, well, we found that uh, the single that that you can cause a problem in a single phase easier than you could cause a problem in all three phases. In other words, you don't even have to take out all three phases. All you have to do is disrupt some power in a single phase, and you can uh, and you can cause damage in a plant where we didn't think that that was actually possible. This is a brand new uh, it's a brand new problem and something that we need to to deal with. But it shows that, and that's, all, that's really part of the grid. That's part of the infrastructure. And that really kind of ties in with the information about Chris, India. can I ask you yep. something? We've only got a minute or two left here. Uh, India, 650 million people without power. Yeah, what do you think of that? Because that's bridge that's... down. How's that? Uh, I mean, there's got to be a lot of nuclear power plants there. Have you got any feedback yet, uh, what's happening there? Was it a CME? Was it a nuclear power plant? Was it a nuclear grid well, failure? Well, a lot of because people think it was a CME, but... Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, or a combination. Uh, a combination, because what I heard is that there was extra load. What I heard is because of the drought, <coughs> a lot of the farmers were using pumps to pump water to try to see if they can keep their crops alive because the drought in India is killing their crops. And there were certain districts that were pulling more power than they could. And because the grid is managed nationally, but the power is mainly made privately, there wasn't enough power being pumped into the grid, so the grid literally shut itself off. Yeah, that's what I'd heard. And, and that's right. But, uh, people were, the, the locals were getting grabby with the available power, and basically what, what happened was you had a grid collapse because the voltage couldn't be maintained on the grid because they're just... It was because of the, the whole thing. Well, what was happening is we're in the drought. It off just a little bit. It wasn't maximum temperature, but the right, but the drought, but the drought was the drought. Yeah, the pumping is what I heard is what caused it. See, we don't have any planning about this in America. We don't have any planning about the CME, extreme weather, and of course the station blackouts and eight plants. This is like a big warning. This is like God talking to you. Do you hear me, people of America? Yeah. If you don't have backup power, if you don't have a better grid with hardened against CMEs. You're not going to have a good day. And what no, I threw in there was that uh, South Korea is having a similar, similar situation with lack of availability of power, and they are very concerned also. So it's not just, it's basically the whole grid really needs to be re revamped and all. And there was even an uh, article I was looking at uh, through a computer science magazine, and it was talking about the vulnerabilities of the smart grid and how it introduces new vulnerabilities. More, More vulnerability. More vulnerability. Thanks, Chris. Excellent report today.